Thank you for joining me. This is Katie Whitledge with the Beyond the Technique podcast. Today, we are talking about how to buy an existing salon. We have Amber O'Hara back. She's visiting us from Southern California. She's looking bright and wonderful and fabulous. And so if you are listening to today's episode, I want you to know that you can see the faces behind the names and watch today's raw, unedited version of the podcast on Beyond the Techniques YouTube page. Go to Beyond the Techniques YouTube channel and click to subscribe while you're there so you get notified every time a new podcast is released. So let me tell you about Amber. She was with us way back, episode 290, where we were discussing how to organize your operations. Let me just tell you about her. She's a board certified colorist and master stylist with over 20 years experience behind the chair. She has worked in all facets of the industry and was the brainchild behind the business of balayage before selling her shares and moving on to open Gold and Braid Salons and House of Collaboration. Her eye for color and passion for involvement keep her at the top of her industry. Her passion lies in training other stylists to create their own successful path in the industry. And a lot of you remember Amber because she is um, committed to her hybrid salon model. And so many people have reached out behind the scenes throughout the last few years and saying, hey, I want to learn more about how to have both the best of both worlds. And that's um, Amber's just been awesome with that. So welcome back, Amber, to be on the technique. Thank you. I'm so happy to be back. (laughs) Well, I'm so happy to have you. And wow, it's been a long time. There's been so many things that have gone on between the last time we've spoken now. But just give us a refresher about Golden Braid and your House of Collaboration. Just tell us just a bit about your brands. Yeah, so my salon brands um, kind of were born... When I was looking for a space to work and couldn't find one, and I really love the independence that booth rental salons offer, but I love the branding and the structure that an employee-based salon offers, so I kind of thought, how could we merge the two, and that's how Golden Braid was formed, so we train our new talent from assistants to employees, and then once they hit their KPIs, they go into a booth rental station, so It's been fun to watch that grow. We're now on location number three. And then um, with House of Collaboration, it's just a bit of a passion project. I have some resources on there for stylists. I have um, an online balayage education course and some other fun things to check out. Well, for everybody listening, we will have the links to everything in our show notes. You got to go follow Golden Braid, check out House of Collab. Um, I think that you'll like love these brands and I certainly have loved getting to know you throughout the years and just seeing you grow and even like overcoming challenges. Of course, the pandemic was a huge challenge, but I feel like we're in a season of opportunity. So recently you had an opportunity I'd love for you to share about when it came to buying an existing salon. Tell us like how this story went for you. Yeah, so I actually... You know, I've always said that I want 50 salons and people think I'm crazy. Um, but at this particular moment, I was not looking. I was looking into other locations because one of my locations, the lease had um, gone up pretty significantly. So I reached out to a broker. They told me they didn't have anything where this location was, but they do have one for sale in another location. And I kind of brushed it off, thought, no, I don't want that location. And then I looked at the listing because I always look into everything, no matter what. And it was a beautiful salon. And I really responded because I couldn't understand why they were selling it for so little. Um, So that's kind of how it piqued my curiosity. I emailed him back and then it got the ball rolling. Okay, so you're in a mindset of growth. You want 50 salons someday, Mm -hmm. but what were some of your first steps that you took, uh, in order to make sure that this was like a really good location and a good financial decision? How did that look? So I first looked at the lease terms. Um, they sent over like the current lease, you know, what they're paying now, what the landlord had said he was 
going to move the rent up to, um, I looked at the demographics in the area. Um, I looked at how many stations I did, um, a financial analysis on what they currently had as far they were just rentals. So what they currently had as a rental salon versus our projections and what we think that we could do with that location. Um, and so once I saw the numbers and they looked good, I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to pursue this with no expectation. I didn't even really want it. Like, I'm just going to do next indicated step and see where we're supposed to land. And here we are. <laughs> okay. So when you were looking at the financials, uh, what needed to be there in order for you to step forward? So it kind of said, kind of sounds like either way you were going to be cool with moving forward because the location was a great opportunity. But I guess compared to how many stations, what did you see as the opportunity of what you could do financially there? So I, I think what I was looking for was, um, like you said, I was probably going to do it anyways, because from a brand building perspective, this is a killer location. So um, even if it were at like a slight profit, you know, it would be fine. But in that specific numbers in the spreadsheet that I put together and was looking at, it was um, the, essentially I was looking at how I could give a raise to my leadership team, which is my general manager, my facilities manager, and bring on another position that I wanted to help run the salons. So if I could take care of my team, build out that location and increase profitability there, mm -hmm. what happens is the cost of burden of my general manager and my operations manager gets spread between the three. And then I brought on a director of marketing, which also gets spread bet between the three locations. So I was basically looking how I could continue to like support my team, give some raises, bring on a new position and have profitability. Okay. And do you, when you take on an existing salon, what does that look like as far as kind of adopting their products, their processes, their systems and their stylists? Yeah. So this was a whole new ball game for me. And I think I underestimated um, the transition and the owner was lovely, really sweet lady, but she was an investor only. She bought it pre-pandemic. The salon was full and they thought, you know, easy peasy. They have renters in there, great location. Um, they're not going there for leadership. They're going there because it's a great location and it's a great place to build. Well, then the pandemic happened. Everybody emptied out and she didn't know how to fill the salon, which is essentially why she wound up selling. But in the meantime, I think in preparation for a sale, she was trying to uh, make her PL not look so awful. And so she brought on all these part-timers and she also built out an hourly station. So that means no matter who you are, you could come in and rent the station by the hour. It was like 15 an hour. So I knew she had done that. I just didn't know how many people were taking advantage of it. So when we got the final list, when we took over, we had about 20 stylists that equaled about two full-timers. <laughs> oh. So um, the first thing we looked at was the people that don't consistently rent. So we immediately got rid of that hourly station. I created a half-day option on Vagaro that they could book because I didn't want to come in swinging. I didn't want to tell all these people they had to leave. I wanted to create a plan for growth. I wanted to see who wanted to stay, who wanted, you know, what we have to offer and who just wants to go do their own thing. So we immediately said, you know, we're going to get rid of the hourly station, but you can book a half day online. There's only one station available and it's first come first serve. So that weeded out a few people. Then we had a part-timer who was one week a month from out of state. And we said, that's no longer an option. You have to be here consistently. So if you're just one day, it has to be the same day every week. If you're, you know, three days, it has to be the same three days every week. We're just trying to create some consistency without actually having to get rid of people. 
And, um, and then the last thing was Sundays. Our salons are not open on Sundays. I do that to like give my leadership team a break so that Sundays they don't have to worry about anything. A lot of times that's when we do repairs and we'll be doing a remodel at this location. So I knew immediately Sundays were not gonna be an option. Um, so those were our, our first big moves. Okay, so really smart. Um, for, and I don't know if I knew, what was the square footage of this new location? This new location is about 2,200 square feet. It's and how many the same stations? as my San Juan location. 16 okay. stations. Okay, cool. And two um, treatment rooms. Wow, that's a lot in that amount of space. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you come in, you revise how the stylist schedules are going to look. Um, I'm assuming that you kind of take out whatever products are there and you put in your new. How did that work? Um, okay, so luckily we are, um, we already used Davines and so did they. So we wound up, um, we didn't negotiate that in the purchase price of the salon because um, I wasn't sure if I was going to buy it because Davines has, you know, they have the introductory offers, which are usually pretty great. Um, but after the fact, we did negotiate and got like a great price. And so we took on her existing Davinus inventory. Um, and then since then, we've reached out to Davinus to become um, like a Davinus exclusive salon. So our salons will be carrying all Davinus with the exception of um, like a thinning hair treatment line that we carry. And then also using Davinus permanent color for our, our permanent color for our guests. So, so that was an easy transition. I will say I did have one stylist who was the Sunday stylist and she only worked a, a couple Sundays a month. And um, if you're a stylist and you're listening, this is exactly what not to do when your salon gets bought out. <laughs> so she immediately reached out and um, what just, I need to know, what are you guys doing? You know, I'm an Aveda stylist and the current owner, you know, lets me negotiate this contract so that I can get my color from Aveda. So I need you guys to do this and I need you guys to do that. And this is like within day one. And I'm like, girlfriend, hold on. I'm just trying to like get the utilities switched over, like make sure the keys work in the locks, like have all these other things to navigate. And um yeah, and she wanted me to become an Aveda salon. So she like specifically asked me to meet with the rep. And I do love our Aveda rep, but I don't want to be in Aveda salon. So asked me to meet with the rep and told me all the benefits to Aveda. So I think what she devalued is that we are an existing brand with existing product partnerships. And she, this woman that works one to two days a month, wanted to come in and control the brand that we already are. And that created some conflict, right? So we told her, no, that's not going to work for us. And the Sunday thing doesn't work. And she wound up getting very upset. And this is my little plug for leadership. Um, I keep joking that this salon, um, the natives were running the land because we came in with, you know, this is who we are. This is our system. Um, this is what we offer. And the ones that were really taking advantage of the lack of leadership were the ones that were the most upset with the implementation of systems and leadership. So it's been really interesting. Very interesting. Wow. Okay. So then you spoke on remodel investment. So let me go to the financial side of this. Yeah. Did you have to take out a loan? do seller financing. What would, I mean, you don't have to share if you don't want yeah. to. No, no, no. Let's get budget. into it. I love, I love okay. the numbers. Okay. So, um, I'll start from the beginning. The salon was listed for 50,000. And, um, like I said, I wasn't overly excited about it. I was just kind of doing the footwork. And when I looked at their numbers and that they had been running at a loss for the last year and a half, I was like, okay, you know, it's a lot of energy when you take on a new location. And so it's like, not even do I have the money, do I have the energy to come in and build this team and give them what they deserve? So that was kind of what I was going through during this process. Um, I wound up being able to get them down to 35000 as a purchase price. Um, and then I negotiated with the landlord to give me some tenant improvement dollars. Um, 
And I have done this before. I did this with location number two. And I've done this when other shopping centers have reached out because they are complementary to our brand and they say, hey, we want to bring you into this location. And so then we've negotiated TI. Um, so in this particular situation, I shared my projections based on what salon um, the salon was currently bringing in. And based on those projections, I would be at a loss for about nine months um, until I started to fill some stations. And then I shared my projections based on what I thought we could do, which is about six months of a loss. Um, and then we start to turn a profit. So I shared that with them. I shared what our existing brand is. Um, they came down and toured one of our locations and I asked for the moon and the stars and I ultimately wound up getting 24,000 in tenant improvement dollars. And my bid for my TI or for my construction for the scope of work just came back and it's 23,000 399. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So my TI will cover it's, you know, fresh paint, replace the existing shampoo bowls. We're cutting down one of the walls, nothing major. The bones are there, which as you know, is the most expensive part. Oh, wow. This is so smart. I'm writing all of this down and are all is the goal for this location to be all renters or will you can, you know, start your model of they start as assistants, then they become associates on the floor, and then they move into renters once they hit their KPIs. So this one will be um, primarily employee based with about 10 booth renter stations available, um, just because based on the location and the we're on a main street in a big city. Um, so based on like, the amount of clients we think we can bring into that location and the amount of so support we can offer to our employees, we will um, keep this about 50-50. Okay. Very cool. What other investments do you have to make? Um... So um, there is equipment. So I do need to, there are bright orange chairs right now, which I do remember about 15 years ago, that was like a very cool thing to do. And they just have kept them. Um, so I need new chairs. We need new retail shelving, um, new light fixtures, signage. I just got the quote back for signage and that's about $4,000, but it's two huge storefront signs. Um, Let's see what else. Obviously, our initial inventory for Davinus um, with our purchase of theirs and then our opening package with Davinus. Um, I know I have it all written. The same like software system that you're using for booking and scheduling. Same and software system, which is amazing. Wow, that worked out. That worked yeah, out. that worked out really great. Um, yeah, that that was interesting. And I, I will talk about this part of acquisition. So I, when I opened my second location, I had my own personal Yelp page that I had had for 15 years or whatever. So I just changed my name and the address to Golden Braid San Juan Capistrano. Well, I was under the impression that I could do the same thing when we took over this salon and they had like 200 something reviews and like their digital assets alone are worth more than $35,000. Their Instagram, their Google page, their Yelp. Um, so we went through the process of acquiring the Yelp page and Yelp denied us. And apparently if it's a change of ownership of any sort, then they, you cannot have that Yelp page, which I thought was really interesting because Google made it super easy. Instagram, obviously doesn't care. And then the, the crappy thing about that is my existing booth renters who are there who have reviews and have had clients from there. And so, I, I mean, I pitched my case to Yelp. They really didn't care. <laughs> so we did have to start a new Yelp page. Um, but yeah, the Vigaro is the same. Um, so that's been really easy to, to merge. And we, we have all of our Vigaro um, contacts merged, which is really nice. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Of course, I have a whole spreadsheet and I will share it with you <laughs> afterwards um, of all did of our... Did you have to look through the lease or did that 
how did you know if you were stepping into a good situation with the lease? Okay. So with the lease, I do have a real estate attorney who reviews all of my um, leases and redlines them. And then we go over them, bring them back to the landlord. Um, but this lease was like a four page lease. It was the easiest thing wow. I've ever read in my life. And I've read 40 page leases. So this yeah. was like a no brainer. Um, I had the broker review it. I had a couple friends that are in commercial real estate review it. Cause I couldn't, I needed like a quick turnaround. Um, and my real estate attorney was taking too long to get back to me. So yeah, essentially it was the easiest lease I've ever reviewed. <laughs> Golden, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh okay. <laughs> yeah. What were some of the unforeseen things that happened since you've purchased that you're like, oh, I did not realize this. Yeah. Um, I think, I think the biggest thing was just, you know, you know yourself and you know what you have to offer or like, you know, it's like, I know that I care about my team and they're the ones that I think about at night when I go to bed and they're the ones that I want to do everything for and make sure they're happy. And going into a new situation, they don't know that they don't know me. And so, um, trying not to overperform for them to like, trust me, but just be there and show that, you know, I am a human being. I am a hairdresser. I do care about my business. Um, and then I think a lot of the, the other elements were, um, just my, my big thing is resource allocation. So I don't want my team to ever feel so burnt out by their job because I'm not hiring enough people to fill in the pieces. And I know right now we're in a period of growth. So just, I, I'm more concerned about my general manager than I ever have been because it's a lot. And um, yeah, so just making sure. So I, I think I've had to be more available and more hands-on in the business, which I sort of knew what happened. I just didn't know it would be to the extent that it is. Um, you know, I'm working seven days a week, whether it's answering emails, booking clients, doing interviews, you know, you name it. That's pretty much. Yeah. Well, let me dive into that. If you don't yeah. mind, what no. additional uh, responsibilities does your GM have with this new acquisition? Yeah. So um, nothing really because. Uh, well, not nothing really. That's not true. So she has payroll. So she runs all of our payroll. So onboarding, onboarding all of our new employees, getting them set up through our payroll company, um, getting their schedules. But along with this location, you know, one of the things that we talked about is um, operational organization before. And so making sure that each location has a salon coordinator to support my general manager. So they're basically taking their daily reports and bringing them to her. So she can be up here looking at everything. And then I can be up here looking at everything. But if I'm down here and down here, I can't see where else we can go. So um, I think just making sure um, yeah, that, that she's supported by her team. So that's a new position that we're building out. We had it pre-pandemic. And then obviously when everybody had to save money, we cut that position. Um, so we have one at our Costa Mesa location that helps with the day-to-day, -day, but she is definitely like, if they have problems with the time clock, they call her. If they have problems with the alarm system, they call her. It's all those little things that I think are adding to her plate that eventually will get trained and will no longer. Like, I just have to remember this is temporary pain. It's like childbirth, yeah. temporary pain. <laughs> um, something I noticed that's kind of unique when it comes to scheduling is how do you handle scheduling at three locations is, but it looks like you just offer online booking if they're not booking kind of in the moment, or is there a way to call? And if they call, do you have kind of three separate spots that you have them call? How do you, how do you work out that part? Yeah. So we have, um, three separate phones. They're each answered like by location. I actually recently, one of my salon owner friends recommended this, um, phone.com, which has been very cool. 
and I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's a web-based phone service. So I can be anywhere and I can stay on top of each location's phone calls, text messages, missed calls, anything that's going on. And so it kind of gives us a little freedom in the sense that if a receptionist calls out sick, I know that, you know, here and there people can cover the front desk, but I can cover the phone. Like there's not a bunch of pieces because, you know, people get sick, people miss work, like stuff happens. And so it's helped alleviate my stress to know that like we can still access those phones. The world's not going to end. <laughs> and um, you can also convert when someone leaves a voicemail, you can immediately respond via text message. So um, you can set your away message. It's been really fun to play with. So during, That's I think it's care of, yeah. Yeah, 10 to 10 to 6 during the week, um, there's a receptionist that answers the phone and then 9 to 4 on Saturdays at each location. Was there anything about adding another location that you said, well, this will be kind of uh, custom to this location or is everything going to be this, you know, same across all locations? Um, so I think as far as like, um, aesthetically, each location's different. So we'll keep the same thing with Costa Mesa. It'll be different than the other two. Um, and what we like to do is kind of like match the vibe of the town and, and bring in some elements of like the local area. And then um, structure wise, the big difference is we don't have a, our facilities manager is only there on Mondays because um, he's already at San Juan and Mission Viejo during the other few days. Um, so we don't have a facilities manager there, which we don't necessarily need. But because, and so our facilities manager usually does like the towels, the cleaning, the repairs, you know, all of those, those pieces to help the day-to-day -day flow. Well, because we're going to have more employees at this location, the idea is that when they have downtime, they're going to be filling in. Um, and then as a result of this growth, we did hire a towel service so that again, you know, over the last few years with COVID, it's like, okay, if he's sick, we don't have towels and it's, everybody's running around and it's crazy. And, mm -hmm. and if he's sick, the salon doesn't get cleaned. So we did just implement with the location, um, third location starting towel service, and then a commercial cleaning company. So they come like two nights a week do a nice good clean and then we have towel service that's delivered twice a week so just kind of trying to automate those pieces that you know when i'm in bed at night the things that like keep me up and make my anxiety go through the roof i'm like i would rather make less money and not be stressed out yeah. and make sure my team is supported and happy and they're not going to leave because their towels aren't done and i'm not offering what i said i would offer when they came on you know well, speaking of the money and, and kind of your goals of 50 locations, what's your why behind that, Amber? What is your ultimate goal? That's not just, I know that you have a huge passion for growing other people in this mm -hmm. industry. What is the thing that's fulfilling for you that, that you're like motivated to continue to grow your brand with multiple locations? Um, I think the most fulfilling thing is the people. And like the mo my favorite stylist is the stylist that comes in insecure, unsure about their work, doesn't know if they're going to be a success and uses the systems that we've implemented through education, building your personal brand, building your clientele, supporting each other and to watch them grow. I mean, that is just something that in the the shit of the shit of all the salon owner stuff we do, that is like the one thing that I can always hang on to and be so inspired by. It keeps you going. Yep. Okay. Well, now that you're one month in to your new third location, how's everything going? It's going good. Um, I am, I did go behind the chair one day a week there. Um, that was the other surprise as I didn't realize like how much I, as a founder, add value to the brand and building both the other locations. I, I worked as a stylist there until we got full. 
And I thought, okay, with the third location, the brand is the salon. So I don't really need to be there. But then again, what we talked about when I saw the lack of leadership that these people had, I'm like, okay, I need to be there. I need to set the culture. I need to set the um, standard for like what I expect these services to be. And so I'm there one day a week. Um, it has actually been really fun. And I think um, we've had quite a few applicants, um, but because I get to be picky now, <laughs> you know, that first salon, it was like, I don't care. We joke, we just hired anybody warm body off the street. I don't care. You have a pulse, great, you're hired. <laughs> um, so now with like a brand and a team that I wanna protect and I want them to feel proud of where they work, um, I've been very picky through our interview process. And um, because I have the tenant improvement dollars, one thing I did forget to mention too, is I did get rent abatement in, in the amount of $24,000 too. So they gave me over a six month period, they're taking off um, a certain amount every month that equals 24,000. Um, so I don't have the like, I'm still losing money because there's not many people that work there, but I don't have that pressure to like get it full, get people in there. doesn't matter who they are. It's like, I really get to be picky and, um, and handpick each and every person that's going to be there. Well, I think it's a testament to the amazing brand that you build in your leadership team that people are seeking you out because many salon owners right now would like love to have tons of app applicants come through. So I think you've done an amazing job. And for everybody listening, Amber is such an open book that if you are like having additional questions or thoughts that you want to run by her, please connect with her. And I will include her incredible Instagram through our show notes as well. Amber, before we're done here, I would just want to ask what would be some final words of encouragement for owners who are considering, or there's an opportunity presented to them to expand their brand and possibly take over an existing location? Um, I think the number one thing is don't devalue what your existing brand has to offer, um, especially when it comes to lease negotiations. Leaseors love working with multiple locations because it's been proven that you can do it and um, brand awareness. They know that you have an existing brand. People are going to seek you out it gives them more security and then leasing their space. So don't devalue what you have to offer. I think sometimes, especially as creatives, we get so excited that, oh my God, I might have this opportunity and don't get lost in that excitement. Ask for what you want. And if you don't get it, be ready to walk away. Uh, the art of the deal. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, <smart>. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you so much for your time and for being here to always just share openly with everybody. I really appreciate that about you. And I love everything that you are doing and congratulations again on your success. Thank you. This was so fun. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us here week after week at Beyond the Technique. We would love if you enjoyed today's podcast, please leave us a fabulous review on your listening platform so that more people like yourself will discover beyond the technique where we are here to change the way that you are supported in your business. Until next time, everybody have an awesome day and stay strong.